Hi, Mark Werwa here from uh, beautiful Langley Alder Grove, and I'm in Ottawa um, with Alex Schattenberg. Uh, Alex is uh, with the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition, and um, he's been working on this uh, very important file for a number of years. He's probably the number one a professional uh, expert on this issue. Uh, you've looked at uh, what's happening around the world, Alex, and uh, I wish you would have been a witness uh, on this special committee to deal with this issue, this joint committee. They've released their report, and uh, the report was supposed to be in line with the Carter decision. We've heard from um, numerous professionals that uh, it didn't go it did not align with the Carter decision. It went far beyond that. Mm -hmm. and And you've seen what's happened in other countries where they have not, um, not protected the vulnerable. And um, could you share some of your experiences that should, the committee should have heard it, um, but Canadians now can hear from you. Um, what are your concerns of the direction that the Liberal government is, is going on this issue and, and what are the mistakes that have been made in other countries? Well, the design of the law is what's important. People talk about uh, how do you provide effective oversight, how do you, how do you uh, have uh, euthanasia and assisted suicide without having misuse of the law. And I say misuse of the law because you know, the law is designed in a certain way by the language of the law. So what we see in other jurisdictions is what has actually led to where we are uh, with the misuse of the law in other jurisdictions. So, for instance, the laws are designed so that two doctors will decide. So what happens is someone might request um, an assisted death, euthanasia, or assisted suicide, and then two doctors decide to, uh, to agree that that's, that that's acceptable for those whatever reasons. The doctor who causes your death, so this is what goes on in all of the jurisdictions, the doctor who causes your death then also is required to send in a report after you died. So we have a situation where doctors are causing a death, they're agreeing to the death, they're causing a death, and they're sending in a report after the person has died, and then, then there's all this concern, well, wait a second, these reports do not reflect the reality of what actually happened in that death. And the reason is obvious, because you don't have a system of effective oversight. You have a system where the person who is deciding that it's okay to, to lethally inject that person, then also goes ahead and lethally injects that person, then sends in the report after the death. The only witness who could say that, no, that report does not actually reflect what occurred, it's already dead. The other thing is, how could that actually be a safeguard, and how can that be about effective oversight when the person has died already before there's ever a report sent into the government about what would happen? Then I hear from the euthanasia lobby. They say, Alex, you know, you're always exaggerating. They say, look at those euthanasia reports from the other jurisdictions. There doesn't seem to be any sign of significant abuse in any way. And of course, the response is yes, but do any doctor self-report misuse of the law? Do, uh, and what we're seeing in the other jurisdictions is significant under-reporting. Now, how do we know there's under-reporting going on? Now, first of all, in the Netherlands, every five years they do a, what they call a meta-analysis, where they ask doctors their experience with euthanasia. And out of that, you can see, out of that data, it shows that there's a significant under-reporting. But also in Belgium, they've done twice now these massive death study uh, studies where they're looking at all deaths. And then they send questionnaires to the physicians to explain what, what happened in this person's death. And what they're finding, because this is not about the euthanasia reports, this is looking at every single death, they're uncovering, oh, we've got massive under-reporting of euthanasia. So, for instance, the most recent data came out from t in 2015 about what happened in the first six months of 2013, and it showed that 4.6% of all deaths in Flanders, Belgium, were euthanasia, which is a huge number. Uh, the only problem with that is only 2.4% of all the deaths are reported as euthanasia. So you've got a 2.2% underreporting, or about 45, 46% of all euthanasia deaths are never reported. Secondly, 1.7% of all deaths, and I'm not talking about all euthanasia deaths, I'm talking about all deaths, the doctors are admitting that they hasten the death, they lethally injected that patient without any request. So that means you have a total number of 6.3, 4.6 plus 1.7, 6.3% of all deaths are intentionally assisted deaths. 4.6% of them are euthanasia because it was done with request. Without request, it's not euthanasia, it would be homicide. And you have no prosecutions, and there's no way to, to, to show it because, of course, you're only seeing this in the data from all deaths. And how come this is occurring? Because the system is designed to allow misuse of the law. The system is designed where the person who approves the death, the person who does the death is the person who reports the death, and then they say, oh, there's no problem with the law. Well, of course there's no problem with the law because people don't self-report misuse of the law. 
Then there's the gray area issue, you know, issues where someone might have been depressed and incompetent. And they say, oh, well, there's no real proof of euthanasia of incompetent people. Well, when you look at these reports, you actually do see that. So you see that the deaths of people without request, when there was no request for that, the intentional deaths, they happen to people on average. So the data shows those people tended to be in the hospital, they tended to be on average over 80 years old, and they tended to have either dementia or coma. So these are people who are completely incompetent, who are dying by lethal injection, no report was sent in, the doctor does it without request, and on top of it, no reporting, no oversight, and no prosecutions because of the design of the law in the first place. So what you have is a situation where if you're going to impose this on us in Canada, we must avoid the same system. There must be an approval system before the death, and you can't be allotting out lethal drugs to physicians who do not have the pre-approval. Well, Alex, the, the direction that the committee went uh, from the liberal-dominated liberal committee and the witnesses that they called and unfortunately, you weren't there as a witness. They didn't call us as a witness, no. No, it's very unfortunate. Uh, they're heading on a pathway that's very dangerous that does not protect the vulnerable Canadians. No. And, um, and so let us hope, let us continue to put pressure on the government to properly represent, uh, go in the proper direction that the Carter decision yep. made and, um, and that they create legislation that respects the Carter decision that does not follow the Belgian model. I have one thing to say. Yes. Uh, we were not uh, asked to come before the committee and I didn't know why at first. It didn't make sense because I've been doing this work full time since 1999. I, I, we've been involved in all the court cases, all the issues from that time through we have been involved directly in all of them. We are, whether people like our position or not, we are certainly experts on the issue, and we were not called to the committee. And uh, so I sent out emails to every member of the committee. You probably received that email simply asking why we've not been called. Does it make sense that Dying with Dignity, Dignity made four presentations to the committee, and we were asked not at all. And one of the members of the committee, a, a liberal member, called me up, and he was very kind to call me up. He called me up and he said, uh, I saw your email and I want to ask you a question, Euthanasia Prevention Coalition, is what's your position? And I said, well, we're against euthanasia, it's just a suicide, obviously. He says, that's why I thought. And he says, well, that's why you weren't called to, for, for the committee. He says, we, we had no interest to hear what you had to say because you were against euthanasia and assisted suicide. He says, that, that boat has already sailed. What we were interested in is how to create a law to do this. And I said to him, yes, but with my experience, I understood what you were looking for, but with my experience, I was going to talk to you about all the data and the studies from other jurisdictions to explain to you what not to have in the law if you want to avoid the misuse of the law. If you want to avoid all these stories that happen in other jurisdictions where people have died without any request, or people have died in situations that don't make any sense whatsoever, that no one would have actually approved uh, as we're thinking of it now, if you want to avoid that, you have to build it into the law with your wording of the law. And I said, so obviously I was going to bring you that data. So now you don't have any of that data before your committee, even though I sent in a report to them, if they read it, I don't know. Uh, the fact of it is, is that they didn't want to hear us because we're against, but in fact, our information is fundamental to uh, ever even being able to protect people in Canada. Well, Alex, uh, sadly, the committee did not hear from you, but Canadians now have heard from you. And, um, and hopefully the government, uh, members of the government and the Minister of Justice uh, will actually uh, listen to what Alex Schadenberg has said. And so thank you so much. And, thank you very and much, And keep Mark. up the good fight. Thank you very much, Mark.